I remember my, my mentor, Roger Brown, once saying um, he was one of the founders of the study of child language acquisition, which is what a lot of my own research has been uh, focused on. And he said, you know, you'll never really understand what children are doing. Uh, this was a, uh, a bit of an ironic comment because, of course, that's what he spent his uh, life doing and what, what I've dedicated much of my life to doing. But it, is, uh, it does offer a little bit of, uh, of humility. Uh, and a feeling that if you don't quite understand everything that's in your data, you shouldn't feel too bad about it. It's extraordinarily complex. We're fortunate to understand uh, what we do understand. Uh, I've gotten advice on uh, writing from uh, an early editor of mine who said, uh, when you try to present science to a, a wide audience, don't feel that you're uh, writing for truck drivers or, or, uh, or chicken pluckers, uh, they probably realistically won't buy your book. And if you try to aim at everyone, you'll end up talking down or condescending. Write for your college roommate, someone who you respect as being as smart as you. They went into a different line of work. They're joining the conversation late. They need to be brought up to speed. But assume that your audience is, is as intellectually engaged and as smart as you are. That was uh, terrific advice, both for teaching and for uh, writing and speaking for a wide audience. There are a number of very big problems, ones that are too big to attack directly, but which we might be able to chip away at by asking answering a lot of smaller questions that, that uh, flow from it. One of them is, um, how did humans evolve? Why did one species of uh, primate, a kind of chimpanzee-like ancestor, um, be selected to walk upright, lose its uh, fur, expand its brain, develop language, become a uh, tool maker, cooperate in large groups, and so on? Why, why did that happen? Another one is, how is the brain organized to make learning and uh, motivation and emotion possible? What are the um, <clears throat> molecular events and physiological events in the growing brain of a fetus that shape it into a human brain as opposed to uh, the brain of some other organism? And what makes a normal human brain as opposed to a schizophrenic or a psychopath or an autistic child? Um, another one is, what is um, the basis of consciousness? Is there, uh, what, what's different in the brain when you deliberately plod your way through something, thinking about every motion or every word, and when it just comes automatically so that you don't even think about it? And can we even understand why consciousness in the sense of subjective experience exists at all? Um, how is the mind organized into, into components? Uh, I think it's unlikely that there's just one magic algorithm that the whole brain uses to solve every problem from walking without falling over to um, organizing words into grammatical sentences to recognizing faces uh, to planning your day. Uh, how many of those systems are there and how do they talk to each other and how are they laid out in the brain? Are they? discrete slabs of real estate, kind of like the, uh, the, the flank steak and rump roast in the supermarket cow display with the dotted lines. It's kind of unlikely. Are they completely interdispersed, like the hard disk of your computer when it's fragmented? So the different parts uh, that belong to one system are scattered all over the place and work because of their interconnections, but we'll never be able to see them as blobs on a brain scan. Is it something in between? How much variability is there from one person to another? Um, what, is, what, uh, what is our innate uh, endowment? It, it can't be something as specific as a particular language or even a particular sexual system like monogamy or polygyny because we know that cultures vary. Some are uh, enforced monogamy, some have polygyny, a few even have polyandry. Um, some cultures speak Japanese, others English, others Yiddish, others uh, Swahili. So none of that can be wired in. On the other hand, uh, there are patterns across cultures. It's not that every logical possibility can be found. In fact, it would be impossible to learn a language or to learn a system of social mores unless you sorted the perceptual input into certain categories so that you could 
begin to crack the code of the culture you're born into. You can make sense of it. Otherwise, you could, if you just recorded it like a VCR or a DVD recorder, uh, you'd be able to regurgitate back what you've seen, but you wouldn't be able to function intelligently to say and do things that made sense in your culture, uh, even if you, they weren't replicas of experiences that you had before. So how do you crack the code of your, your language and culture? There's got to be something innate that it's <clears throat> not easy to put your finger on because it can't be as concrete as a particular cultural product, uh, but it can't be so um, generic that it wouldn't give you the tools to figure out your, your culture. So what is that in-between ground that might be our innate endowment? I think any kind of um, creative discovery depends on uh, having first been immersed in a huge sea of motifs and elements and ideas and uh, then recombining them in some way. I think the idea of a, a lightning bolt of inspiration hitting you out of, the blue, uh, out of the blue and a fully formed idea emerging is very rare or non-existent. Uh, I've, I've been impressed by how much people in all kinds of fields have to do an apprenticeship of exposure to a huge number of ideas <clears throat> before they uh, can accomplish anything original. Um, if you talk to a novelist, they've read thousands of novels. If you talk to a, uh, a, a good rock musician, they'll have an enormous record collection. Uh, if you talk to a scientist, they'll, be, uh, they'll, they'll know a huge amount of information in their own field. Um, for me, synthesizing ideas really depends on having a universe of ideas to, um, to, to recombine in the first place. And one of the things that means is not staying within your own discipline. Uh, not only for me have I not have I done cognitive psychology outside the boundaries of cognitive psychology by looking at linguistics and philosophy uh, and and literature, but uh, even beyond that in understanding the mind, you can't just do it within the the uh, the straitjacket of psychology. As much as I love the field of psychology, it's a small uh, subset of ideas, and that ideas of how our emotions work are as likely to come from an economist uh, or from a game theorist as from a psychologist. Uh, ideas about um, our, uh, our, our sexual lives are as likely to come from an evolutionary biologist studying uh, insects as from someone studying uh, human beings in a psychology lab. So for me, it's very important that the traditional academic disciplines don't get in the way of finding ideas wherever they may be found, wherever they may live. As someone who who uh, works in the science of human beings, the boundary for me between science and other fields is, is kind of porous. Uh, what is essential in 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 my finding an idea useful is that it come from someone who uh, thinks systematically and uh, rigorously and rationally someone who cares about whether an idea is true or false. That's what I, someone who's interested in an explanation in why something is the way it is as opposed to some other way that it could be. For me, that's the essence of science. That's what's valuable about science. But it's not restricted to, to scientists. And things that used to be not science become science over the course of history, like, like my own field, psychology, as, a, as an example. Uh, and so uh, I don't try to think laterally or just get inspired by some strange image from fiction or, or, or music. Um, but I do take seriously ideas that might have originated from uh, a novelist commenting on human nature, either directly in an interview or obliquely via a novel. Uh, I would care about what a, a historian might say, <clears throat> as long as they are doing so in the general mindset that I think of as scientific, that is trying to explain things and caring about whether the things you say are true or false. I like to think that uh, in addition to making some, some empirical discoveries, how, how little things work in the, for me in the case of language, uh, that I hope to have helped put things together. There's so much of, of science and of scholarship consists of hyper-specialized 
through efforts. You necessarily have to pick one narrow topic because it's tractable. It's something that you can, uh, a single person can hope to make headway on uh, in, a, in a lifetime. But when, when you do that, you also lose sight of the big picture. If you study uh, nothing but irregular verbs or experiments on word recognition, you lose sight of a question like, what's language for? How does it work? A uh, question that, say, a layperson quite reasonably might ask, but which most specialists are completely ill-equipped to answer because they ha necessarily have to, to, to focus on a particular phenomenon. I like to think that I have also helped draw the big picture. Uh, in the case of language, the uh, idea that uh, language works uh, by an interplay between memorized units that we call words and rules for combining them, and that the reason that we have language is that we are a species that lives off social cooperation and uh, know-how, and that language is an evolutionary adaptation that multiplies the power of uh, technological know-how by allowing us to share it and uh, that allows us to negotiate relationships. So that is a kind of a nutshell description of how language works and why we have it. That I think is not so obvious uh, that, it's, that it's helpful for someone to, to draw the picture in, in such broad brush strokes. Uh, and I like to think I've done the same or, or helped do, do something like that for the, for the human mind. What is, how does the mind work? What is a, a human mind for? Uh, the idea that the mind is a system of uh, organs of computation, that is, information processing subsystems that evolve by natural selection to allow us to figure out how the world works and uh, figure out how other people work uh, as a survival strategy for Homo sapiens it is a, a general idea. Uh, but it does help to make sense of the whole shebang. It, you, I, I think it offers at least some potential of, of a, a satisfying answer as to, to why we have a mind and what it does. So both at the microscopic end of how uh, irregular verbs work and why kids make errors on them, and the macroscopic view of what is language, what is the, what is the mind.